Hey, good, good afternoon, guys. Uh, so we have a really kind of exciting grand round today. We have three excellent speakers. I'm going to try to keep all their accomplishments short. Uh, you know, I wish I was reading my CV. These are much longer, much more impressive. So uh, three speakers. The first was Dr. Pronovost. Um, you know, he's a world-renowned patient safety champion, critical care physician, great researcher, has over 800 publications, and uh, has really done a lot of good work in patient quality improve or safety and quality improvement. His checklist has saved countless of lives, and he won a Genius Grant in 2008. He joined the UH family back in December of 2018, and is currently serving as the Chief Clinical Transformation Officer. Fortunately, that's all the time <laughs> for you. It's, it's much longer. It's very impressive. Uh, our second speaker is the current Chief of the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension, Dr. Srinivas. He's a transplant nephrologist by training of you know, 20 years of experience in kidney and pancreas transplantation. He comes to UH having served as a medical director of kidney and pancreas transplant programs and dialysis services at Intermountain Healthcare prior to coming over here. He has also previously served as a medical director of kidney and pancreas transplantation and section chief of transplant nephrology at the Medical University of South Carolina and as a transplant nephrologist at the Cleveland Clinic and the University of Florida prior to that. Dr. Srinivas's clinical practice spans the gamut of transplant nephrology with a spe special focus on paired kidney donation. His research interests are centered on the outcomes of kidney transplant transplantation, living donor wellness, clinical trials and immunosuppression, pharmacogenomics, biomarkers of transplant injury, and big data-driven care delivery pathways that drive value in kidney transplantation and nephrology. Last but certainly not least, Dr. Karan is a medical sociologist and data scientist here at UH. He did most of his training and pretty much all of his training at University of Florida prior to joining us. He's won multiple awards at University of Florida as well as um, nationally, and he works closely with the teams from Case Western Reserve University College of Medicine with the goal of helping to implement theoretical academic work into a large re regional health system. We're lucky to have these three very accomplished gentlemen join us today as, as we start our grand rounds. Thank you. Okay, it may seem like a hodgepodge of three different speakers, so let me perhaps uh, orient you to what we'd like to accomplish today. But first, I will kind of present about what population health is, where UH stands in this space, and where, the, where we see it going, and most importantly, celebrate some of the really amazing work that you've already accomplished this year. Uh, second, uh, Srinivas is going to go through uh, use case of chronic renal disease. And so what does population health really look like when you de dive into one disease? And then finally, uh, Justin's going to share with you some of the pretty amazing data tools that we have that you're probably not even aware of that UH is really innovating on to help manage populations and drive uh, population uh, health. So with that, let me start with the question. How many of you have had a patient who was readmitted uh, at least once within the year? How about five times in a year? How about ten times in a year? So UH across our system has around 800 patients who are admitted ten times or more in a year. So the question is, whose job is it to do something about that? Is it yours? Is it mine? Who owns that? So fundamentally, what population health is about is thinking differently that our goal isn't to have people heal in hospital. The goal is to keep people healthy at home. And value, that is, we'll get to that definition in a second, but helping them be healthy at home is all of our responsibility. What that means is that we're evolving from a health system that is transactional and reactive to one that is relational and proactive. What do I mean by that? So I, with, whether one of your patients is Helen, a COPD patient who we work with who's been admitted 20 times, or Jim, a heart failure, or Sue, a sickle cell patient, the narratives are all the same. When they show up, the part works brilliant. <coughs> you give them really, really, really great care. But our mindset is too narrow and transactional. You show up, I give you your steroids or your antibiotics or your afterload uh, reducers, and you go out, but we don't think about, okay, who's then keeping them healthy at home? I did my, my part. And we have a health system 
that has forced us to optimize the part and often compromise the whole. Population health, or in our case, our ACOs, are mechanisms to try to help incentivize changing that narrative. UH is about the fifth largest ACO in, in the country. It's really remarkable. We care for just under 600,000 people in our ACO. So that's roughly 50% of everyone we care for. What that means fundamentally is that we are, in some ways, incentivized to keep people healthy at home. They, we are responsible for their total cost of care or the, the quality of care that they have or long-term outcomes. Now, the mechanisms vary between Medicare, Medicare Advantage, the Medicare Shared Savings, Commercial, and Medicaid, but forget that nuances. All it means is that we now have a big stake in the game, which is great, to keep people healthy at home, which is the kind of care that all of you want to give. And the definition of value varies, but the way we think about it is it's really a function of the quality of care we give plus people's experience of that care over their annual total cost of care. Annual total cost of care. That means that Helen who comes in 15 times with COPD, it's not good enough to give her her steroids, give her an inhaler, and come back in. Because Helen's story was she came in all the time because every COPD exasperation, exacerbation was preceded with anxiety and nobody diagnosed it and nobody treated her anxiety. Right? And, and so there's constant examples of that where we weren't thinking broader because my job was to optimize the part and now we have to start thinking. We've been, not that I'm a checklist fanatic, but I am a checklist fanatic, of thinking about defects in value, this idea of where are their shortcomings in three domains. In defects in helping people stay well, that is, did you get your immunizations, your cancer screening, your wellness exam. Defects in managing any chronic disease, and Dr. Wright, it's your great work in blood pressure here, but thinking about, is the disease diagnosed? Or is it 40% of people with hypertension or more aren't even diagnosed? Are they on the right therapy? Half the people are generally on the right therapy. Is their physiology or symptom control? If you take diabetics, 11% have their A1C, their glucose, and their blood pressure controlled, and have we avoided needless hospitalizations? And, and with any chronic disease, it's 80, 85% of people have needless ED visits or hospitalizations. All those people when your hand went up for these readmissions because we're not managing these defects. Now, these are largely invisible to us. We don't intend them. We are doing the transactional piece. Part of what you'll see our analytic work is making these visible to us so that we have a more uh, refined picture. And then the last category is defect in managing an acute condition. You all should be congratulated with some of the work you did. First defect is, is care coordinated with primary care? We went a year ago with 2% of people being discharged in the hospital, too, with the PCP follow. We are now up to like 60% here. A remarkable transition. It should be higher, but still, nobody wasn't there with any malintent. Nobody thought it was my job. Is what we're recommending appropriate or beneficial? As you all probably know, virtually every procedure, including PCI, 30% are deemed inappropriate. For spine surgery, the number is more like 44 to 45%. If you get a second opinion or use guidelines, you don't need it, but we don't routinely do those things. Is the site of service optimal? Half, at least, of patients who show up in the ED could be cared for in a lower cost, higher setting, but we haven't seen that. We, we used to send somewhere around 30%, 35% of our patients to SNP after hospital discharge, you are now down to about 18%, right? The percent of people going home went from 62 all the way up to 80 simply because we put some standard work in there. And Keith and the residents are really the ones who drove that, so great kudos to you. And is the care provided by a high quality, a high value provider, we know there's a four to eight X variation in your value that you get depending on which clinician that, that we go to. So what are we doing at UH to try to do this? Well, there's this concept that we call the web of well-being, and it's not just hoping, that there's four interventions that keep people healthy at home 
that haven't been systematically applied or we haven't had the technology to link that web together. The first is, are people competent in self-managed? Any guess what percent of people with chronic disease are competent in how to self-manage? Yes, it's around 20 percent. You ask, whose job is it to teach self-competence? Right? We, so one of the things we've done at Ontario is we assign someone to be the direct responsibility individual to produce content, and then we're democratizing that content wherever you are. You show up at the urgent care center, you get the same content. Hospital discharge gets the same content. But we didn't have a system to do that. Second concept is increasing the dose of social support. You all live every day people who have really unmet social needs that they come back in because we don't have a mechanism, a systematic way of surfacing needs and connecting people or delivering to those resources. We're standardizing that. Third concept is, and this is really innovative, this idea of the dose of inventory. The concept is, you know, we've debated whether keeping people out of the ho hospital with heart failure leads to a higher mortality rate, and to me that approach is misguided. Because if someone needs care and we keep them out of the hospital, what do we think is going to happen? They're going to do well. But the issue isn't admitting them. The issue is giving more ambulatory, uh, more ambulatory care. We took a pilot where we increased the dose of heart failure patients at Chiaga, and I won't bore the details, but they were basically touched about every week by either a nurse in the ACO or a cardiologist intermittently. We took their readmission rate at Chiaga, it's only been six months, about 35 patients a month, but enough signal from 42% to 4% to last two months, 0.4%. Like unheard of performance, and what do we do? We just titrated up the dose and trained in the self-management, and the last is of reducing avoidable ED emissions and diversions. Some early results to say this isn't just conceptual, like you are moving the needle. We reduced our length of stay across all of UH by 0.4 days, and 2,000 excess days. We increased post-acute costs, we'll see, by 25%, 25%, and overall annual Medicare costs by 9%. Ridiculous amount of improvements, more ridiculous amounts of waste. The discharges to home went from 60 to 80 percent, and I know I think some of you are working to publish it. That is breathtaking work to take a big AMC and get that many people going home. And as you know, this isn't just it's nice to go home with co-pays and deductibles. That's real money in people's pockets that they could afford to do things because bankrupt healthcare is the number one cause of personal bankruptcy in America. Just an example of that red line is UH. As Northeast Ohio, in general, UH in particular, grossly overused post-acute for a whole bunch of reasons. It was just the norm to send people to SNP. This is your amazing work by putting standard processes to get people home rather than to SNP in a little over a year, 25% off spend. is just breathtaking. So that's kind of the macro journey of where we have going. Srini's now going to take you into what does it mean now to apply these, some of these principles to patients with chronic renal disease? And as you will soon see, the two principles of managing po populations are one, having the analytics to create cohorts of populations, and two, being able to monitor them over time. That it's not just transactional. I need a longitudinal picture to monitor their annual cost, and you'll see brilliantly how Srini and Justin are doing just that. Thank you, Peter. So of the uh, seven people that put their hands up uh, for who had more than five readmits, uh, five of them were nephrologists. Okay. So we do have a problem, and a lot of you have noticed through the echo service, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. We readmit the same person. That person will readmit to the consult service, will go off to the off echo service and come right back, right? And the same person, revolving door and you write notes on them in a two-week cycle in four different services. So that's kind of the picture. Even, so this is something that I came here from Intermountain Healthcare, which is basically an integrated health system that's closed. And we had complete follow-up of about 1.1 million people within our health plan. Even in that system, a patient would arrive at the ER in renal failure, 
but no knowledge of their kidney disease because CKD is largely silent. And they would then get their first nephrology consults. And bingo, our misaligned health system completely aligns for this person that's been neglected because there's money to be made at this point. So everybody comes in. In our situation there, it was for-profit dialysis organizations that went right there and had people, two nephrologists, trolling around our system all the time. And they were then referred to their uh, dialysis unit, sit in a chair, ruin their lives, and bring profit to a corporation that has shareholders. That's, the, that's dialysis. And they had no little or no education and options. They had absolutely no idea that they could have potentially gotten urgent start peritoneal dialysis. They had no idea that they could get home hemodialysis. Uh, and they had no idea that they could be referred only for a transplant or they could have been referred for a transplant when the GFR was 20 ml per minute. Those patients had no clue. But once you get into the dialysis chair, you are essentially on a pathway to bankruptcy unless something really good happens to you. <clears throat> Why is this happening? Insurance, private insurance, pays 300 to 500 percent of Medicare to keep a person in a dialysis chair. Medicare pays 240 dollars, cost of dialysis, all things, nursing, medicines, filters, everything, 170 dollars per treatment. Private insurance pays 1,100 to 1,200 dollars per treatment. So it takes four dialysis patients with private insurance to declare a profit on a dialysis center. That's all it takes, four. And so that's the misaligned incentive on the which the nephrology world is acting. And so this whole problem is not cheap because most of the cost is coming from comorbid conditions that have been neglected because all the focus is on squeezing that profit on the machine. So this is the one. Um, so in the U.S., it's not a rare problem. 37 million U.S. adults have CKD, right? And so that means one in seven people has CKD. And one in three adults with diabetes and one in five with hypertension are on the pathway to CKD. And obviously, the causes are there in the pie chart. Even in a closed health system with a complete EMR that's spanned across its 189 clinics and 23 uh, uh, you know, hospitals and 1.1 million covered lives, in the only 11% of identified patients using a prevalent protocol, which was there, a clinical process guideline as to how a patient should be identified, treated, and referred to nephrologist, only 11% were referred to nephrologist. And of course, the private guys came back to us and said, no, 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 we take care of everybody. We have everybody. Okay, let's even double that. Only 20% then get referred. 70% was still crashing in with NCSC and disease. So we decided that we'd go upstream of CKD, that we would not just go uh, after what's in our ERs and in our wards, but let's go upstream. Because if you have a system where you are responsible for the cost of care of that patient, you want to go upstream and manage that. Okay. So all this was happening while we knew that transplant, if there's one take-home message that you take from this lecture, transplant doubles your lifespan if you do it right. There's not too many other things in medicine that double your lifespan. But the only other thing that doubles your lifespan the way transplant does is highly active antiretroviral therapy and the other is hep C treatment. Everything else uh, is kind of competent and you can argue about it, but this stuff that works. We knew this, yet people are not being referred to transplant. We also know that patients who are referred to transplant before they ever see a dialysis machine or a dialysis modality do the best, yet these patients are not referred because there's no real incentive to refer patients for transplant. So, that uh, previous slide was, uh, and the second thing that you need to know, this is pre-listing for end-stage uh, transplant uh, waiting time. This is post-listing waiting time. This is the time that a patient spends um, being worked up for a transplant, going through the throes of their acute illness and so on. The longer this duration is, the worse it is for mortality. And it likely is a surrogate both for disease severity and for the level of access to medical care. 
to have access to good medical care, this can probably be moved. Post uh, uh, listing duration of end stage renal disease doesn't really affect outcome. Again, speaks for a rationale for upstream care. So this is using registry data, which has a predictive accuracy of about 0.65. So we decided to take a different approach, uh, yeah, is using all the data through an EMR. In this case, it was EPIC and a legacy EMR system in Charleston at MUSC. And we said, you know, in a transplant patient, there's an abundance of data at a patient level. We, all we have on transplant patients are data. We know when the disease starts because that's the day of the transplant. We know when the disease ends, that's when the patient dies or the graft fails, and we have close clinical follow-up. Using that and using some of the IBM Watson technologies, we did what a glomerulus does. We ingested all the data, we spat out what we didn't like, and then we essentially refined what we had and built a predictive model. That's what your kidney does every day, right? Filters, reabsorbs, secretes, concentrates, and then excretes. And so that's what we did. And if you take this line here in a predictive model for a three-year graph trial, the first line is the what comes out with national data, a predictive accuracy of 0.65. You add to that some social determinants of health, it gets a little better. You add to that uh, comorbid conditions from the EHR, it gets slightly better. Then you add everything, the whole enchilada, you know, blood pressure trajectories, GFR trajectories, um, a person's hemoglobin trajectories uh, as to after recovery of transplant, pulse rates, everything, uh, you know, admissions, um, things like whether uh, they had an MI or a stroke after the transplant. You put all that, you have a predictive accuracy of 0.85. It felt really good. But then a person who wrote an editorial about this basically said, you really need all this? Uh, you, you're just predicting when somebody crashes. What are you going to do about the crash? So they came up with this thing that, you know, a good hockey player knows where the puck is, right? I don't have a teller hockey crowd here uh, who says this. It's being gritty that a great hockey player goes to where the puck's going to be. Then we looked at the causes of, you know, of uh, why the rats failed. We found that some causes were primary care, some causes were transplant related. So if you actually fed back the output from a model, into the into EPIC, which we were able to do, which was our EMR there, you could then trigger primary care teams of the transplant team and engage in care pathways. At this point, it was felt that transplant did not need this kind of investment because they already had the care pathways. So we decided to take it and myself to a different place. Uh, but I moved on to Inter Mountain, where I'll show you the build that we built. But first, I want to show you how Justin is using tools to very analogous to what we did using IBM Watson, but here at UH, and helping us track value and outcomes in our population. And then I'll show you what we built and what you're going to help me build here. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Shane. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm curious, by a show of hands for those of you that are with us today in the room, how many of you coming in today have heard the term data science? So for those of you that are remote, about two-thirds of the room are raising their hands. And for those of you that are in the room today, how many of you have had an opportunity to work with a data scientist to optimize healthcare in your day-to-day -day work? And for those of you in the room, I think I counted six. Six hands out of a whole auditorium that have about had that opportunity. And we are in a, a new day today. Our contemporary medicine is showing the collaboration of interdisciplinary professionals at a larger frequency than we've ever seen in history. Today, data scientists are able to partner with clinicians in order to help <clears throat> become better diagnosticians, to help treat populations and cohorts, and conduct population health management where it's a value to a health system or a hospital. <clears throat> I want to spend a couple slides here today discussing the value of data science, specifically when we collaborate with clinicians, and we're going to use a CKD example today and look at data a little bit here at University Hospitals in order to understand the value within chronic, uh, chronic kidney disease. But for those of you that don't know what data science is, for, for a few of you in the room, it's a multidisciplinary field that uses scientific methods, uh, processes, algorithms, modeling, 
in order to extract knowledge and insights from structured and unstructured data. And this is more important than ever now that we're in a world of EMRs. We went from paper records to electronic medical records, and the amount of data that we put through our healthcare system annually increases and almost doubles annually. It's at the point where an Excel spreadsheet may only show you enough data about a patient from one day of care. Think about that. You can have 1.2 million rows on an Excel spreadsheet, but it only may give you enough information about one or two days of care about that patient. When we start looking at a healthcare environment, EMR systems are built in a transactional way. You enter in codes into the EMR, it lists it in a table. It is meant to be able to show you information in a one-way window, put in information, and create a transaction. <clears throat> but that's not how we analyze people. That's not how we look at the value within healthcare on day-to-day. -day. We look at it by longitudinal assessments. We look at it by understanding all the different points of data that could impact a person and understand that holistically and then treat the patient as a whole person. If we silo our data, we're also siloing that insight, and that's a problem. That's one of the first things data scientists coming over here to healthcare started solving. You siloed all your data. When I was promoted to be the first data scientist in 2017 here at University Hospitals, I recognized in January of 2017, we had 180 disparate systems that all the data at UH went across. I would ask any one individual clinician, how did you know, just amongst your patient panel, and the average patient panel for a PCP here is between 1,500 and 1,800, how do you know who your highest spenders are? How do you know who your highest ED utilizers are? Which ones have the highest frequent readmission rates? And who's failing based on their MSSP measures, meaning the Medicare Shared Savings Program? Not one person was able to really give me answers to any of those questions. And that's population health management. So a data scientist is going to help partner with clinicians in the modern contemporary healthcare system in order to do multiple functions. One, capture the data that is needed by the clinician. Let's make sure that our systems are capturing it correctly, that we have all the data, and it's flowing into an area or database that we know of and we can work with. Maintain. This is how they're going to capture electronic data. Maintain it. One of the first projects that I worked on was to create University Hospital's first enterprise data warehouse. We had to take those 180 systems and harmonize it into one longitudinal model so we can look at a patient holistically. So the financial information coming from payers is not in your EMR. Your scheduling information is sitting in a scheduling system. Your laboratory information is in a laboratory LIS system, soft lab. None of it's in one spot. You can't look at one window through one EMR, at least in an all scripts ecosystem, and then see everything occurring with your patient longitudinally. So what data scientists are going to further go, and after maintaining, we're going to process that data, pull it out of the EMR, analyze it, visualize it, and deliver it back to the clinician in a way that is meaningful to each of you in this room, in a way that you want to be able to see the data to conduct good clinical medicine and good patient-centered care to your patients. And then we're going to communicate and we're going to keep that process going. So the data science process in healthcare, and I wanted to take a second to look at this because Part of that evolution we're talking about of using data strategically is also understanding the collaborators that we collaborate with day to day that we may not necessarily be used to collaborating with. So in the textbooks, we talk a lot about the harmonization of clinical teams. How should a nurse interact with a doctor and how should a technician interact with the care team? And we have all of these intricate communication handoffs and they work like an orchestra. When it works well, it works in great synchronization. Now let's look at our administrative staff that support an overall health system and how do we start orchestrating the way you do in hospitals and, and on different care teams with further physician extenders. An analyst, a data engineer, a statistician, and a data scientist are not all equal. They all can bring different value to the process. And this is just a quick process that I just wanted people to see visually of all the different steps that data scientists will do in partner and collaboration. So it's not just go query the data in EMR and let me say how many female patients we have. It goes beyond that. It's being able to understand the relationships in the data and why are those relationships meaningful and put a clinical context to it. And that requires a lot more domain knowledge, a lot more understanding such as epidemiology, epidemiological surveillance, nonprofit financial services, and understanding how do you do return on investments. And then if you're looking at the triple aim, how do we bring all that together? 
So, <clears throat> using an example, see which one's the top one. Okay, this top left here, what you're seeing is an actual live example of how a data scientist can add value partnering with a clinician. This top left is a system we call Alterx. What we're showing here is a data engineering step of taking data from a bunch of different sources, harmonizing it into a single table so that we have a relationship model to be able to now look and understand the comparisons of our patients. So that first step just allows us to ask the question, who are our patients with CKD? And just asking that first question is not enough for effective population ma health management. For example, we may be able to tell you how many patients have that disease, what is their average age, even what their gender split is, or the total number of chronic conditions out of a list of 18. However, the story is actually drilling down into all the different segments that define the people that are within patient cohorts. There's a story here. And if we look at these the two groups, so CKD patients on the left and non-CKD patients on the right, one, we can see those with CKD on a risk-based population health algorithm that is looking at stratified risk, your higher levels of risk are dominated by CKD patients. And when we look at a non-CKD patient population, that whole relationship changes. So there is something going on in our current methods that show that these patients are extremely sick, and not just with one diagnosis of CKD. And that's part of what I'm getting at. Is it just CKD that's causing our risk stratification models to completely almost go inverse? No. There's something else happening within the data that, and what's going on with the CKD patients. Here, look at the cost. A CKD patient costs three times more on average than a non-CKD patient. And if we were to stop there, we may not have any further insight into what that means or what's going on. But we don't stop there. A data scientist is going to start asking the questions. Well, why is it that way? How do we know what's driving those costs? So let's actually tease this out a little bit further in an example. Now, if we start now looking at CKD patients and bucketing them into categories of how many chronic conditions you have, and let's look at what their 12-month average medical spend is, we could start seeing that there's a story here and that as you have more comorbidities, in addition to CKD, the amount of money on the health system or even individually on that patient increases and increases dramatically, that it's actually the intersection of being able to treat this patient holistically and an understanding of all their chronic conditions together that we may be able to bend that cost curve and the triple A. This is a really quick thing that if we were to stop in that previous slide, you may not even understand the geospatial layout of where are all your patients and do we actually have issues in different areas of a large geography. So if you're running a health system and now we're trying to understand where are the patients that spend the most money or who are the sickest or who has the most conditions, where are they? So being able to do geospatial analytics, share the data back to clinicians is also important and something that we should ask for frequently in order to help business planning, capacity planning, and other areas of population health management. So I'm going to hand this back off over to Srini, and I'm happy to answer further questions later a little bit more about data science. Justin, thank you. And so this work that Justin showed you, obviously he's been doing it for a heck of a long time, building all this together. That was the tough part. Sitting down with him was, what, between 3 and 4 p.m. on Friday? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's how we got those data, just sitting there. So it's important to be able to, so our job as a doctor has changed. It goes back to what Osler said. Most of our job training is on trying to figure out what kind of disease a patient has. Osler said it's more important for you to know what kind of patient has a particular disease. That's the type of question that we need to be asking in population health. Uh, and let's flip it one more slide and say, who is going to be the person that is going to cause the greatest societal burden, and how do we actually help that person maintain their economic viability and for us to maintain economic viability of society? So what is most gratifying was when I went and looked at when we did our work and then we looked at what has been published, you see here that as we progress from CKD1 to 4, per person costs increase dramatically tenfold almost when you go from CKD stage one to four. CKD stage one is not very different from non-CKD patients. And total, and um, so this, so, but the interesting part further for you here 
is that there are 10 million enrollees here in CKD stage 3, but only 563,000 by the time you get down to CKD 4. What happened to 9.5 million people? So clearly, they went away somewhere. They didn't just get cured. A lot of them died of comorbid conditions. And that's where the contribution of comorbidity comes. So the numbers don't tell you exactly what you want to flip the question on its head. And the way I'm looking at it now is, is are we just treating CKD or or is CKD an anchor in a health system to find the people that cause the greatest pain? And I have a role with Dr. Pranavost of, of, you know, looking at chronic conditions for the ACO as well as for the employee health plan. And so we are going to be looking and doing deeper dives and put systems of care on these folks so we can take care of them. So let me show you what a prototype looks like that uh, I had the good fortune of building before I came here. And the assumptions were that it's a national challenge, there's increasing costs, and that totally misaligned incentives with the for-profit motive that is there in CKD and dialysis. And there's underdiagnosed disease, both that people don't know about chronic kidney disease, and they don't know they're blind to comorbidity. And there's uncoordinated care, and there's resource intensive care. In the old model, everything went towards the dialysis center because that's where the economic center of care was. That was your factory. You took all your raw material, went to the factory, okay? And that's where the profit was extracted by any industrial operation. There are shifting winds now. There's new technology that allows you to do dialysis much more safely at home, including hemodialysis. Uh, One of the good things that came out of the president's office is an executive op- order uh, that actually talks about incentivizing home dialysis and transplantation, but it's also put a whole bunch of financial carrots. So every dialysis company now is calling themselves a transplant company. Of course, they're going to follow the money, right? So, and there's going to be Medicare Advantage for dialysis in 2021. So there's tons of uh, things that people are after. This kind of technology that I'm showing you is a game changer. What you see here is a dialysis machine that does not require a dedicated water supply. It's about the same size, just a little bit bigger than a dorm refrigerator. And bottom half houses concentrate, top half house has the blood pump. A patient can hook themselves up at home to hemodialysis with this machine. It hooks up to tap water and goes into standard drain. It's got a sorbent cartridge that absorbs the dialysate and recycles it and you can essentially dialyze anywhere. You want to you want to go tailgate and have an Ohio State game, find yourself something near a faucet, and you could be dialyzing and watching on your big screen TV in your RV. Okay? <laughs> so that's, that's how good this stuff is now. And so that opened for us an idea of, okay, could we put this thing in malls? Could we put this thing um, there in uh, near diners? Could we put this where you find dialysis patients? And so that if people can just say, hey, I'm at the mall getting a haircut. By the way, I just want to get my dialysis. So you just go and check in. You got your little card. So you're playing with that concept. But in the meanwhile, what we did was we had to build a new dialysis unit. So we just built one without water. So normally dialysis units have a huge water treatment plant and everything. So we built in Rufton for plumbing, but we did not put water. We essentially had 12 of these machines that people can come and hook up to, and they can essentially be dialyzed and get out, and you can increase the time on dialysis and do all kinds of things. It allows you to train people to do their own dialysis. And the best outcomes are with hemodialysis or home hemodialysis. This would empower a patient that you discharge to be able to do something like this at home. Anyway, so what we did was we put in a software program that identifies all patients with kidney disease, and patients with late-stage CKD would be preferentially then channeled towards preemptive transplants and home dialysis modalities. All care would be coordinated by a team of nine, eight patient care navigators, just four nephrologists, and eight advanced practitioners. So it flips the model of not having a whole bunch of physicians, but having more ancillary support staff. And the primary care physician practices were kept as the medical home for the CKD patient as opposed to the dialysis unit. And so this is what and, you know, you can script all kinds of things according to the stage of CKD. You know, you do stage appropriate management, and all this gets 
basically pop to you on the screen on the EMR. And it's also managed by what we call a customer re, uh, uh, relationship management or a CRM tool in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, business speak. They're a company that has access to your software and are able to identify patients will engage patients in conversations starting at each stage, and they'll be able to convert them towards preemptive transplants, home dialysis, empower them in self-management, feedback the results of your of their interactions back into the algorithm that makes it refined each time it finds those patients. For example, the way I've written it, the, it was finding patients that had already seen a private nephrologist. Then when we went and looked, the, nef- the consults to that private nephrologist were not being placed through the EMR. They were based on telephone or chance encounters. So now we're going to a next generation of using natural language processing to put the names of everybody that is a nephrologist and their NPI numbers so that we can identify when a consult was placed and how to take care of those patients. So that's the kind of stuff that and the world that young people are going to be living in uh, as you graduate, because you better learn this stuff, because this is the way your mind is going to learn from. And this is just a prototype. And as you can see, we've had excellent success with this model that was put in. It went live on September 5th. I joined here on August 1st. As of November, last week of November, they'd already seen 365 new patients at Inter Mountain, which would otherwise would have gone to a private uh, place. And they already identified six patients that were started on dialysis and 20 transplant reference. Okay. So that's how powerful this kind of tool is. And this is the kind of way that we want to do. Uh, the, uh, we want to build it here, and that's what we're working towards. Just last, this month, came out in print an article by Arnie Milstein's group from Stanford talking about the attributes of high-value nephrology practice. And they're generally, what they do is they prevent near-term costly health crisis, they support self-care, and they maximize office visit efficiency. So it's not one doctor going there to this place, that place, let's not go into our EMR yet. But anyway, but they actually have a very efficient office practice, and they select very cost-effective care pathways and develop an infrastructure for high-value care. Successful practices all practiced using protocols standardization of care. So the way the future goes is, you know, by the time you can put a stethoscope on somebody and listen and find out that they've got, uh, you know, rows and things like that, fantastic. But that's not the way we should be practicing. We should know well in advance in very Australian fashion what type of patient is likely to have that disease. And that's where <coughs> one needs to go with our physician and our ability to personalize care and not say it's the art of medicine to do it one step at a time like an artist. And also, these folks develop infrastructures for high-value care where they have cross-disciplinary people, they escalated the ability of medical assistants to perform at the top of their license, they maximize the use of their ancillary staff, and so on. And those are the ways in which we are going to be challenged to practice. So, um, so that's uh, that. So, you know, was, I'm coming to the final part of what we want to talk about. At least, at least a few minutes for questions. So, Dr. Berwick talked about the triple aim of improving outcomes, lowering costs, and improving patient experience. That brings to us on the right side a leadership challenge, and something that comes to all of us who are going to train up for who are either training people or who are being trained by people and are going to go and practice independently, you have to essentially say, if you're going to lead a team, and as a physician, the day you get MD behind your name, you're a leader, face it. And please don't think you're a follower, because then you'll always be following. When you become a leader, you need to identify spheres of collective good. Build clinical microsystems that help you deliver on that collective good monitor the efficiency of that of those systems and then improve on the success of those systems. That's your job as a physician. That's your job as a leader. Okay. And then if you use predictive analytics, work with a data scientist or a data science team, plus your electronic health record, I'd like to call this e cognition. 
where you actually have uh, something that supplements your intelligence about people, and that will help you deliver care, measure success, and inform you as to future direction. And so let's leave with a thought to call, call to action, and for the final thought, we need to focus on value rather than transaction. How much, can I, how much money can I make off you today? No. What collective good am I building for society, for our future, for our sustainability? You work with a data science team to build systems of care. Don't just go there and open a clinic and hope that people will show up. Geomap, figure out, hotspot, construct a design for the clinic, a workflow for the clinic. In the present, you have to deal with these things, so code, you know, hierarchical conditions and things like that that make you money in the present. But reduce the admissions by increasing the dose of ambulatory care. Empower your patients with CKD to think of preemptive transplants. Empower your patients and families to think of home dialysis modalities because they're here and they're here today, and we need to invest in those. Consignment to a dialysis chair in a center should be the last option in the SRD and CKD. Don't even think about it until you've exhausted those other things. Okay. Here's a slide that shows you value. I saw this patient in Greenville in, my, in Charleston when I was in, at the MUSC. We used to ring a bell uh, every time a transplant happened. The patients would walk across and ring it. And then, Dr. Salada, we never cultured that uh, cable. But, uh, but they would ring a bell. And it, it, was, it was very nice. Then I saw this patient in, uh, in, uh, in Greenville, in clinic, and I did a double take. This lady had her transplant in 1987. And the resident that was taking care of her, that was rotating, was also born in 1987. That's valid. That's the kind of stuff that every patient with CKD and ESRD should have. If they have to have CKD, that you could not have prevented. That's valid. And that's exactly what we need to build together. Okay? Thank you. We do have... Time to some questions, right? Questions from anyone? So, uh, chronic kidney disease is clearly because of the readmission rates, the cost, and everything else that uh, was articulated is really a focal point uh, part of the process. But what other comorbidities are you focusing on or prioritizing system wide? Yeah, great uh, question. We're doing a, a number of things, some specifically for our health plan. Um, for probably for the ATO. Um, and uniquely for our employee plan, we have 55% of our ED visits are deemed inappropriate and 25% could be cared for by the primary care office, but we either don't have access to that or it's not our, our culture. So we're pretty lazily focusing on getting people increasing their ambulatory support so that they don't uh, come here. When we look at uh, where we have opportunity, one of the programs we're into is called the bundle program. You may, may have heard of that. What The scary part of that is it's our first program for downside risk. What, what do we mean by that? That means we're paid a fixed amount of money from hospital admission for the next 90 days. And if the patient gets readmitted or goes to a SNF or spends more than on average, we write the government a check. <laughs> and it was a little scary because we started this with absolutely no systems in place to measure all this stuff that we do now. So when we look at what are those diseases that are driving it, it's not surprising that COPD, enormous opportunity in this. We have ridiculous amounts of readmissions and ED visits and not great um, systems in place for that. Heart failure, not surprising. COPD and heart failure differ a bit because COPD is largely managed by primary care rather than cardiologists, but still working on that. ESRD, liver disease, another huge area. Um, interestingly, GI bleed to have a readmission rate over 50% in, in, in for some of these. And again, we haven't plugged them back in after we scoped them or, or uh, uh, whatever you do, and acute MI. So those are kind of the six chronic disease. But overlapping that, Bob, is one of the really important things we're doing are integrating both behavioral health and palliative care in a more holistic way. Let me give you some examples. 
when we looked at any chronic disease, if you have a behavioral health diagnosis, your spend doubles or triples. Heart failure without depression or anxiety is 42,000 a year. Add depression, 100,000 a year. Any guess how many of our people with behavioral health are actually plugged into behavioral health care? Probably 20% is a huge, we've underinvested in it, and so we, with Patrick Reynolds and Bob Bronis, standing up a number of programs where we have this community access or direct access to psychiatry where they get seen within a week, they get a diagnosis and treatment, but up to three visits, but then they're back into primary care as a scalable model. But thus far, we've launched it in 60 primary care practices. We're scaling it to more, but it turns out you can, without severe mental illness, in most patients, we're averaging 1.4 visits to get them on. Uh, Ken, great to see you here. But palliative care is another huge, uh, huge, huge issue, because when we look at these complex patients, this Trini said most of them don't have one chronic disease. They all, they're all, and most have behavioral health issues that we put a box around for a variety of reasons of separating behavioral health that we're now integrating. And probably a third of those patients have advanced or fixed chronic diseases that what they really need is palliative care and advanced illness management. And it's another area where we uh, underinvested in. We're trying to find ways to deliver or, or integrate palliative uh, care in more holistic ways, and whether that's a palliative care clinic, telepalliative care, we're still innovating and experimenting, but it's the chronic disease that you know about, but thinking of it holistically of how do we get, I mean, I, I'll give you an example. One of the things that just stunned me, in our employee plan, we've been digging into it, 98% of our admissions, 98% had a secondary diagnosis of depression, anxiety, or behavioral health. I would have never guessed it. it's that high. The behavioral health was the primary diagnosis for around 15% of our admissions, high, higher than outside of us, but maybe not that surprisingly. But I would have never guessed that 98% have it listed, and again, fewer than 20% were even getting that care. So uh, we're thinking holistically. Um, bring up an issue related to this. Um, I, I thank you very much for your kind comments about the care that residents give. I think the residents do give great care in the acute care setting. Our residents also staff an ambulatory setting here at UH and the third floor of Wobo called Douglas Moore Clinic. And there's been an attempt to try to get patients, walk in patients, employees there, but we've had really, really hard time getting senior leadership or hospital leadership to invest in it. It's a highly understaffed, highly dysfunctional place. So the same residents that give fantastic care for acute inpatients have a really hard time giving care in this dysfunctional place. I'd like to have a dialogue with senior leadership. I'd love to have a dialogue with senior leadership. trying to meet the goals you guys talked about. Yeah. The residents with you know, more RNs, more MAs, a higher functional place, because it's a disaster right now. Yeah, that's Absolutely. totally great. This was great. Like, I look at your sickle cell patients. I mean, one of these, the number of examples, right, are your COPD patients. Yeah. Like, they don't need to be admitted. They don't need to be We need a place that you can give them, or where employees can go. Direct access to Exactly right. So, uh, I mean, I think, just Keith, as you, you know, in, you know, when I first started this, idea of keeping people healthy at home scared the hell out of people who are used to saying my, my, you know, my revenue is keeping hospital filled. And I think we've evolved that people now get value is the way of the future that we're increasingly paid for and we have to build systems and we didn't have them. So I thought, I'll follow up with you. And, and, um, yeah, one question there. Yeah. Uh, that exactly is my question. How, do you see, just thinking about the transition the idea of
on a fee-for-service model only, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we get from here to there? Yeah, so can, great, uh, great question. And that's right. Our physician comp model is antithetical to what I just said. So let me share with you some of the things that we're doing now to be financially responsible. We are launching in 600 care practices next week, actually. The job postings are already up. A model of advanced primary care. What does that mean? That means our primary care practices were on a net revenue minus expense model. In other words, if you wanted an MA, you paid for it. So surprise, none of them have MA. You wanted a nurse, they paid for it. None of them have it. Even though we know that there's value. So we are funding uh, the model is a, a nurse for about seven patients to care for uh, the chronic diseases, several MAs to do wellness and a behavioral uh, health but social worker. I won't bore you. We were behind the times because most of those things we could bill on. And in more progressive health systems, they cover 100% of their cost. We're modeling. We can think we can recover about 80% of it. I mean, so you give better care, and there's still ways to win in, in that fee for service. And if we're at risk, we get shared savings. So we're using that. Those physicians are on a new comp model that, that we're doing because you can't be on the churn if you're going to see someone. And so what we've done is they're back off of the sole RVU productivity. There is some productivity, but it's a much lower threshold. But they're incentivized for the quality of care that they give these, these people. The first year, it's an upside only risk. But the second year, it's up, more upside, but still some downside. So if you keep people, you reduce your readmission rates or your ED visits rates, you're incentivized to drive value. We need to do that for the specialist. It's more complicated. And we have to do it specialist by specialist, which we're getting this primary care model launched, but we'll be working with Bob and the other chairs to say, what does that look like for the various specialties so they're in, uh, uh, incentivized. The other way that we survive in this is we still have some of our revenue in fee-for-service. And if you can't manage value, if you don't deliver the care in network. I mean, the reason why Kaiser is so effective is 98% of Kaiser care is given within a Kaiser facility. We leak about 25 to 30% of our care, meaning they're in our ACO, and admittedly, we have to clean up the attribution. It's one of the things Justin and right. I are working heavily on, but they get care at a variety of places, which means we don't get the data, we can't uh, manage the handoffs and work, We've worked very hard to coordinate and break silos amongst our post-acute care, our home care, our primary care specialists. So the things that you all could do is make sure we keep care in network because there's plenty of volume of people who really need care that they get the care they need and the ones that don't need care, we keep them uh, healthy at home as a way to balance being in both fee-for-service and um, in a value base, mm -hmm. but I think they, not I think I know the board and the leadership gets that we the only moral and appropriate thing to do is for all of us to say we need to give the highest value care and not try to game this well. But I need to keep them admitted because I have to get my hospital filled. If they if that's what they need, that's what they get, and we'll figure out how to deploy the economics around it. Can I add one thing to that, Peter? Probably should not take right, maybe one quick question. Jackson? Yeah. Uh, it's not quick. It, it deals with social terms, becomes health and resources and considerations around deal, dealing with uh, that huge elephant in the room and social determinants. And, and what are the considerations that, that are. Uh, yeah, Dr. Wright, you are um, so fine. When I um, started in my role, I would say the three areas that were significantly underinvested. I may even say the word neglected were palliative care, behavioral health, and social determinants. And they, like, we, we, they were viewed as peripheral. Um, we're not doing enough um, in there. We standardize our assessments of social determinants needs and try to have a standardized process that can connect people to resources in the community. We started some community health worker programs or built upon uh, Dr. Larkin's pandemic, great work to try to support that, but we're just scratching the surface. The one uh, 
really a, a kind of innovative and hopeful thing that we're doing is we, for the first time, are looking at the social determinants holistically in our employees. There's pretty clear data nationally that people who are paid less than $15 an hour, whatever threshold you want, uh, are at risk for food insecurity, for housing insecurity, and uh, we have full capitation for these, these people. And so we're uh, looking at that. Justin and I and our ACO team are purchasing the social determinant data because we were blind to it. We don't really even know what some of these data are. So rather than outsourcing it, we are incorporating that into our data model that we will begin to systematically look at it and treat it as no, no other thing of how do we surface a need or diagnose a need and connect people to uh, the research. I'd love to talk more with you and, and about it. It's with those other two areas, I think we it's where we're going to have to focus if we're really going to drive annual cost down. So thank you. Thank you.